right now on Morning News Now. Donald Trump says it could come any day now. This morning, the former president is lashing out ahead of what could be more criminal charges against him, this time related to alleged efforts to interfere with the 2020 election results. All of this just one day after an alleged co-conspirator faced a judge over those classified documents found at Trump's Mar-a-Lago home. We'll bring you the latest. Also this morning, life behind bars, a dramatic end to a years-long murder trial that gained national attention. This morning, an Idaho mother is set to spend the rest of her life in prison for killing her two children and her husband's ex-wife nearly four years ago. Jesus Christ knows that no one was murdered in this case. Accidental deaths happen. Hear her final message in court and reaction from the victim's loved ones. Hate or censorship? New this morning, Elon Musk's ex is taking an online fight to real life court. The company, formerly known as Twitter, is now suing a hate speech research group for what it calls a scare campaign to limit freedom of speech. We'll break down the claims and what it could mean for the company. And sky's the limit. We'll introduce you to a hot air balloon pilot who's defying the odds after a life-altering accident nearly ended a lifelong dream. And we are back together again. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. (laughs) Enjoyed a little long weekend. I'm Joe Fryer. Good to have you with us on this Tuesday. And I'm Savannah Sellers. We're going to begin this morning with the mounting legal troubles for former President Donald Trump. The grand jury investigating whether Trump interfered with the 2020 election is expected to reconvene today as charges potentially loom. Just yesterday, Mar-a-Lago employee Carlos de Oliveira appeared in court for the first time as part of the classified documents case. Now, de Oliveira is facing several several charges, including conspiracy to obstruct justice and giving false statements to investigators. Long weekend. I'm Joe Fryer. Good to have you with us on this Tuesday. And I'm Savannah Sellers. We're going to begin this morning with the mounting legal troubles for former President Donald Trump. The grand jury investigating whether Trump interfered with the 2020 election is expected to reconvene today as charges potentially loom. Just yesterday, Mar-a-Lago employee Carlos de Oliveira appeared in court for the first time as part of the classified documents case. Now, de Oliveira is facing several charges, including conspiracy to obstruct justice and giving false statements to investigators. According to that indictment, de Oliveira was instructed by the former president to destroy footage of the classified documents being stored in Mar-a-Lago. It is unclear whether that video actually has been destroyed. Trump has pleaded not guilty to the 40 charges he faces in connection to the classified documents. That trial date is set for May of 2024. NBC News Justice reporter Ryan Riley joins us now outside the federal courthouse in Washington, D.C. with the latest. Actually, he looks like he's at his home there. Ryan, good morning to you. So, unless your home looks like yeah. <laughs> the courthouse there. So I'll be what there in a couple hours, first of all, enough. <laughs> exactly, you will be there. What did we learn from yesterday's court appearance by De Oliveira, and what happens next in that case? So because he didn't have a D.C. lawyer assigned yet, he did not enter uh, a a plea of either guilty or not guilty, or rather a Florida lawyer assigned yet, Um, he needs to have someone who is locally assigned um, to be able to take on that case due to local court rules. Uh, So essentially, we're in a little bit of a holding pattern there. But I do think that adding an extra defendant uh, could complicate the idea that this trial is actually going to go forward in May. And that was already sort of obviously a big obstacle because there are so many things that are going to be on Donald Trump's calendar. This is such, uh, you know, as you add more defendants, essentially, it becomes a much more complicated case. Um, if you're dealing with the deletion of these videotapes, that's a whole other component uh, of this investigation. So it really does you know, call into question whether or not we're actually going to see something move forward there. And just very quickly, you get to the 2024 uh, general election, because you know that's right basically before uh, the end of the primary, right before uh, the Republican National Convention is what it's set for essentially right now. Um, and all signs are sort of pointing towards Donald Trump uh, being the the person who ultimately wins that nomination. So, you know, either way here, it's going to be pretty complicated, I think, to get uh, that case uh, around by the time, by May, especially now that we have this extra defendant added in. Speaking of elections, let's talk about the case that surrounds the 2020 election. As we mentioned earlier, the grand jury investigating the election interference case is expected to reconvene today. Remind us what's at stake here for the former president and how does this compare to some of the other ongoing legal challenges he's facing? 
Yeah, this is the big one, because this is one really is about the peaceful transfer of power and Donald Trump's efforts uh, to stop it. It's basically the the, the biggest investigation that uh, Jack Smith um, is taking up. Remember, he was assigned those two initial assignments were um, into the question of uh, January 6th and or efforts to stop uh, the, the transfer of power uh, to interfere with the election um, in that critical period after uh, November 2020 um, and January 6th. And the other component of this was the handling of the classified documents. So, you know, this is the other big one. Um, certainly the classified documents case is important, but this one really is just at the heart of uh, the democ our democracy and uh, really uh, speaks to some of these broader issues um, and really what all sort of kicked this off. All right, Ryan Riley reporting, kicking us off this hour. Thank you so much, Ryan. And now let's turn to some international news. Israel's prime minister is defending his government's recent controversial decision to weaken the Supreme Court as part of a broader judicial overhaul. NBC News foreign correspondent Raf Sanchez spoke exclusively with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. He joins us now from Tel Aviv. Hi, Raf. Great to see you. So Netanyahu is really digging his heels in over Parliament's decision to pass this bill that essentially weakens the power of the Supreme Court. What did he tell you about that? How did he explain this decision? Yeah, Savannah, good morning. One part of this interview is really leading the news here in Israel, and it is to do with the possibility that later this year, the Supreme Court will strike down this legislation, basically ruling to preserve its own power. And the question of whether or not Prime Minister Netanyahu will respect that ruling. Take a listen. I think we have to follow two rules. One is Israeli governments abide by the decisions of the Supreme Court. And at the same time, the Supreme Court respects the uh, basic laws, which are the closest thing we have to a constitution. Uh, I think we should uh, have, we should keep both principles, and I, and I hope we do. So you are committing, if the Supreme Court strikes down this legislation, you will abide by that ruling? Remember what I said, I hope that they don't strike down, because I think we should abide by both rules. Savannah, I asked him twice. Neither time would he emphatically say yes, he would respect the Supreme Court's ruling. Mm. And to the ears of many Israelis, it sounds like the prime minister is hinting at a possible constitutional crisis if he doesn't get his way. Savannah. Raf, so we've talked about how divisive this whole thing has been in Israel, the protests we've seen. It's even something that prompted the country's president to warn about civil war. What did Netanyahu have to say about that? I think you asked him directly about that question. Yeah, it's not just the president. A poll last week found 56% of Israelis fear that civil war is a real danger. I asked the prime minister about that. Take a listen to his answer. There won't be civil war. I guarantee you that. Uh, but I think that correcting the imbalance in Israel's democracy, where the uh, judiciary is basically arrogated to itself, nearly all the powers of the executive branch and the legislature, I think, yes, it is important to do it. Uh, I think when the dust settles, people will see that Israel's democracy has been th strengthened and not weakened. And Savannah, just the fact that we're even talking about the possibility of civil war in Israel gives you a sense of just how deep the divisions are here. Absolutely. Raf, of course, I also have to ask you about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I understand that you asked Netanyahu about the allegations of apartheid specifically made by several prominent human rights groups over their treatment of the Palestinians. How did he respond to that? Yeah, so I asked him about the situation in the occupied West Bank, where for 50 years you have had 2 million Palestinians who live under Israeli military control, but do not have a vote for Israel's government. A number of human rights groups say that's apartheid. I asked him for his response. I think it's hogwash. I mean, the whole idea that is of ethnic cleansing is what they're talking about. We should get rid of the Jews because otherwise we can't have peace. We have to uproot Jews. That's like saying to me that uh, the million and more Israeli Arabs, Israeli citizens who are Arabs should be kicked out because we can't have peace unless we have a cleansed uh, uh, state. No, we are going to have to live together in uh, creative arrangements. Now, the prime minister told us he was hopeful about one day reaching a historic peace deal with Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. But guys, I got to tell you, talking to him, I really got the sense peace with the Palestinians very, very long way away. Guys. Oh, all right, Ralph Sanchez, great interview. Thank you for your reporting this morning. This morning, Ukraine is recovering from a deadly Russian attack that was launched on President Zelensky's hometown. It comes just one day after a drone strike on Moscow. NBC News chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel has the latest. 
With two missiles launched at Ukraine, Russia destroyed much of an apartment building full of civilians, killing a 10-year-old girl and her mother in President Zelensky's hometown. It's unclear if the strike, which Ukrainians described as terrorism, was retribution, but it came just 24 hours after drones exploded in Moscow for the third time in days, hitting high-rises in downtown and making President Putin look weak and the capital vulnerable. Russia blamed Ukraine. Zelensky, while not claiming responsibility, gave his most direct admission yet of cross-border strikes. Gradually, the war is returning to Russian territory, he said. In Ukraine, Russian troops are battling and intensifying Ukrainian offensive and doing it without some of their most experienced troops. Mercenaries from the Wagner Group are off the battlefield after their leader, Yevgeny Prigozhin, launched a short-lived mutiny. Putin branded Prigozhin, once a trusted aide, a traitor, but then cut a deal with him. The potential reasons why are now becoming more clear. Prigozhin posted that Wagner troops are, for the moment, in Belarus, awaiting orders. And video from Belarus shows the mercenaries training special forces. Poland, a NATO ally across the border, is on high alert, just in case. But Africa seems to be Prigozhin's main focus now. We reported how Wagner, in coordination with the Kremlin, props up weak African leaders, including the president of the Central African Republic, in exchange for control of gold and diamond mines. Just last week, Putin hosted 17 African leaders in Russia, and on hand to greet them was Prigozhin who says his network in Africa is expanding. Prigozhin challenged Putin and embarrassed him. But it seems as long as Wagner is still in business and still making money in Africa, an accommodation is being worked out. All right, Richard, thank you so much. Well, this morning, the Idaho mother convicted of killing her two children is facing life in prison. A judge handed down that sentence yesterday to Lori Vallow Daybell. NBC's Miguel Almaguer has more on the end of this tragic case. I do not fear death, but I look forward to it. Reading from I notes not, moments before a judge know. ordered her to spend the rest of her life behind bars, Lori Vallow Daybell, the Idaho mother convicted of killing her two children and conspiring to murder her husband's former wife, broke her silence and remained defiant. No one was murdered in this case. Accidental deaths happen. Suicides happen. Fatal side effects from medications happen. I know for a fact that my children are happy and busy in the spirit world. With Valo Daybell claiming she has spoken to the victims in the afterlife, the tragic and bizarre case led to sensational headlines. Dubbed the doomsday cult mom, Valo Daybell claimed her children were zombies and she was a goddess sent to usher in the biblical apocalypse. The mutilated bodies of 7-year-old JJ and 16-year-old Tylee were found on the property of her new husband, Chad Daybell, a self-published author who wrote about Doomsday and whose former wife he is also accused of killing. I have always mourned the loss of my loved ones, and I have lost many in this mortal world. As the judge admonished Valo Daybell for showing no remorse, prosecutors say the motive was money, arguing the mother killed her children to collect benefit checks. The crime scene was a horrific thing to have to review. Despite the heinous crime, Valo Daybell's attorney pleaded for mercy, but family members say she deserves none. Yeah, we're done, Lori. We are done with Lori. She is no more to us. Chad Daybell, who has pleaded not guilty, faces similar charges his wife Lori was convicted of. His trial on murder and conspiracy to commit murder is scheduled to get underway next year. He, too, faces life in prison.
Back to you. All right, Miguel, thank you so much. And now let's get you to weather. We're tracking storms in the plains and triple digits in the south. Let's get a check on that. Yeah, meteorologist, Ange meteorologist Angie Lastman joins us now. Angie, good morning. Good morning, guys. Again, another day of triple digit temperatures, mainly focused through the south, though. If you look back to last week, we had a whole lot more of these alerts in place. But still, places like Wichita, Oklahoma City, Dallas, and extending out to New Orleans are under these heat alerts. We also have some heat watches in place for places like Phoenix and Tucson. No surprise there, more than 40 million people are under those alerts at this time. And for good reason. The South is really going to stay into those triple digits for the extended period. We've got temperatures today headed to 107 in Dallas. That'll flirt with that record of 107 for this date. San Antonio as well headed to 103 and could potentially break a record in Houston later today as our temperature heads to 104. Looking ahead to tomorrow, no break from this heat. The same area continues to be under this heat dome, so we'll still see temperatures high 90s for New Orleans, Houston 103. And you know when you have access Actual temperatures like that, the humidity levels are going to be elevated, so your feels like temperatures once again are going to be much warmer than that. So just be aware of that if you're going to be out and about in the south over the next couple of days, still needing to take it slow uh, and drinking a little extra water and taking care of your neighbors and friends. That's going to be something you'll have through the rest of the week, basically. Meanwhile, in the northeast and parts of the Midwest, we've made major improvements. You probably noticed it over the weekend. We've seen these temperatures falling back to those normal values. We were into the 90s into the early part of the weekend. We've seen now an improvement and we're going to end up into those low 80s for places like New York as we round out our work week. Detroit ends up at 87 on Thursday, but low 80s by the time we get to Saturday. So some improvements as far as temperatures go. We've also got some showers and even a couple of strong thunderstorms that we could deal with through the day today. Most of it is going to be centered along the Rockies in the midsection of the country. We could see some stronger storms through parts of the northern plains, but also with that comes some heavy rain. We've got multiple rounds of rain that are expected. And for that reason, we've got a flood watch already in effect for parts of the Rockies, Denver's and included in that and the storm system will continue to move a little farther to the east on the front end of it that's where we'll see the rain working through parts of Missouri from basically Iowa to Kentucky over the next couple of days but we've also got those uh, heavy downpours expected in parts of Colorado today and we could see some strong winds and even some hail in parts of the northern plains guys so uh, you know in the southwest still dealing with the triple digits but they've also got some rain which helped them over the past couple of days they definitely need that a little, a little yeah, yeah. Well, thanks Angie Welcome back. This morning, Memphis police are searching for answers. They say a man tried to break into a Hebrew school, then opened fire on the building when he could not get in. The suspect is in critical condition at a hospital there. NBC News correspondent Blaine Alexander joins us with the latest. Blaine, good morning. Well, Joe, good morning to you. You know, this was an unbelievably close call. Police are calling this a potential mass shooting stopped only by a locked door. Now, school was out for the summer, but there were people working inside. And this morning, officials are crediting a strong school safety plan with potentially saving lives. It's the bone chilling emergency call describing the terrifying scene unfolding outside a Hebrew school in Memphis. There was a male white wearing a green shirt on a property armed with a gun. Authorities say that suspect tried to force his way inside Margolin Hebrew Academy, but was met with a closed door. When he couldn't get inside, he opened fire. A suspect did try to enter the building armed with a gun. When he could not gain entry, he fired shots outside the school. In a letter sent to parents obtained by NBC News, school officials say the suspect encountered a contract worker with whom he had a brief confrontation, saying the suspect fired two shots from the gun while retreating and an additional two shots while leaving. He then took off in a pickup truck, triggering a massive manhunt, with police immediately putting other potential targets in the area on high alert. We need officers to go to every Jewish facility in the city of Memphis with that broadcast and description in case he tries another facility. It all came to an end less than five miles away when police cornered the suspect who emerged from his truck with a gun and was shot by officers. He was taken to the hospital in critical condition. Incredibly, no one else was injured and police are praising school officials for their fast action. They were able to provide us with a photograph of the suspect. They also provided us with the vehicle description that the suspect left. According to Tennessee Representative Steve Cohen, the suspect is a former student at Margolin Hebrew Academy, although police have not confirmed that. The incident that police have described as a potential mass shooting is leaving many parents deeply shaken. So many emotions, you know, nervous, angry, scared, 
anxious. Gila Golder, who has two young children in the school, says she's grateful officials had a safety plan in place. Security is, is absolutely a priority for our community. Now, all of this comes on the heels of a shooting at a different Tennessee school in Nashville back in March. That one left three students and three adults dead. Now, of course, all of that sparked a number of calls statewide, including from lawmakers, to strengthen gun laws and school security in Tennessee. And, Joe, those calls have only grown louder with this latest incident. Back to you. All right, Blaine, thank you so much. International headlines now. A security guard is in custody after a deadly railway shooting in India. NBC News foreign correspondent Ali Aruzi joins us now with that in other world news. Hey, Ali, good morning. Good morning, Savannah. Good morning, Joe. That's right. An Indian railway security guard has been arrested after he allegedly shot dead a colleague and three passengers on board the train. The guard apparently fired 12 rounds, killing a colleague and a passenger. He later allegedly killed two other passengers in two separate train coaches, according to Indian media reports. An Afghan branch of the Islamic State group claimed responsibility for a suicide bombing in Pakistan that killed at least 54 people at a pro-Taliban party's rally in one of the region's worst attacks in recent years. ISIS-K said the attacker detonated the explosive vest and that the bombing was part of the group's continued war on forms of democracy it deems against Islam. And finally, a railway station in Japan is testing out an automated translation window to help confused foreigners navigate one of Tokyo's most complex transportation hubs. The device lets customers speak to the station attendant over microphones while a semi-transparent screen between them spells out their words in Japanese and 11 other languages. So no excuses for missing a train in Japan <laughs> is your headline. That guys. is one of those things where you're like, that looks like the future. That is a great idea. Now. I mean, just me and the New York subway system. Yeah. I'm like, where am I supposed to go? What train am I supposed okay, to take? Well, you have me for that. Allie, thank you <laughs> thank so much. You. Hollywood is reeling from a stunning loss, the death of actor Angus Cloud. Cloud's representatives say he passed away yesterday at his family's home in Oakland, California. Family sources told NBC News that Cloud had just laid his father to rest in Ireland a week ago, and he had been battling suicidal thoughts. The 25-year-old was best known for his role on the HBO series Euphoria. Cloud's family released this statement saying Angus was open about his battle with mental health, and we hope that his passing can be a reminder to others that they are not alone and should not fight this on their own in silence. And a reminder that if you or anyone you know is struggling, you can call or text the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline at 988. Which is heartbreaking. Well, now that is a good segue to our weekly mental health check-in. We are taking a closer look at maternal mental health this morning. A new report shows most states are failing mothers. Plus, black women are leaving the office, and research shows it might have to do with safety concerns. Let's bring in licensed marriage and family therapist and friend of the show, Dr. George James, to help walk us through all this. Hi, Dr. James. Good morning. Great to see you. So according to a report from the Policy Center for Maternal Mental Health, nearly every state in the country received a failing grant for access to maternal mental health care. Look at this right here. I mean, the only one you can even see, the highest is a B minus. That's in California. Only 10 states got higher than a D. What puts pregnant women at risk for mental health issues? Why is it so tough to get that addressed? And, and what should a pregnant woman know? Yeah, good morning, Savannah. Yeah, you know, the first thing I did was to find where my state was. And and unfortunately, so many states are not serving the needs of, of pregnant women and women who are, th are thinking about what their choices might be. And unfortunately, this system was, uh, was failing women from before some of the law changes. And so what we need to do is really we need to think about, regardless of where we are on what we believe in terms of abortion, that we need to serve the needs of women who who are at the place where they need support around their mental health and to find services and for them to feel safe enough to go seek mental health therapy or treatment 
and not feel uh, alienated. And unfortunately, that's what is giving some of these states some of these bad grades because they aren't providing the services that are needed. Absolutely. And so important to after pregnancy, once you've had your child, to make sure that you're watching out for your mental health and addressing any yes. issues with a professional. And that's something that's also not talked about nearly enough is postpartum issues. Um, doctor, let's also not turn to the workplace. A new study, it's from this app called Exhale. It shows that black women are leaving the workplace. 40% have left their jobs because they felt unsafe in the office due to their race. What a staggering number. What kind of impact does these racial aggressions in the office, what, does that, what can that do to an employee? And can it be addressed without letting your mental health suffer or leaving the job altogether? How can we find a middle road? Yeah, this is where we, we see uh, the unfortunate power of intersectionality, where being a woman and being a, a woman of color combined has created extremely um, uh, uh, extra amount of stressors, of negative uh, influences, and where black women feel like they're encouraged to be resilient, to be strong, but there aren't resources and support. And so feeling like the only option is to leave or to quit. So what we need to do, once again, is to support more women of color, more black women to feel that it's okay to to be overwhelmed, it's okay to be anxious, it's okay to be depressed, and to get the support and still be able to stay at work. So more uh, companies need to support their employees, as well as more resources even outside of work. Hopefully that might help people to feel like they can stay at work. So important, such important advice there. Um, also, I wanna ask you about something a lot of people might be seeing online, ice baths. People are jumping into these things, they're posting on social media, many saying that it helps with their mental health. Is this real, doctor? Are there any benefits to, to doing one of these ice baths? I think if you talk to the people who are doing it, they'll tell you, of course, there are benefits. And, you know, for everything that we can't say that there's a, a magic pill, but what people have found that when they jump into these ice baths, there's a way that their anxiety actually uh, decreases for that moment because they're focused on being cold, right? There's also a dopamine increase, which means their, their energy boost might be there. There's a way that they're focusing on what might be present. And it actually helps them to control their, their breathing, which is also very important and the thought about being resilient. These are super important for people in this moment. Dr. George James, we always appreciate when you come by. Thank you so much. Great conversation Thank this you. morning. Well, with record high temperatures that we have seen across the U.S. this summer so far, and we're talking about every morning here, it is important for everyone to remember to stay hydrated. But children, they're one of the more vulnerable groups when it comes to staying on top of hydration, especially if they are playing outside this time of year. Well, lucky for us, we have Dr. Edith Bracho Sanchez. She's a pediatrician and contributing editor for She Knows, and she joins us now to help make sure that you are making sure that your child is getting enough water. Good morning. It's great to see you. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. So I do not have any kids, but there are these are this is one of those things that comes up where I'm like, how does someone figure this out? How do you know how much water and how do you make sure that your child is? So how much water should a child be drinking each day and how can you make sure that they're getting that hydration? Yeah, so I mean, it depends on the age and depends on what they're doing and depends on the weather. So if your child is below six months, they're too little, they can't really be having water yet. So mm -hmm. they really rely mostly on breast milk and formula. Above six months to age one, they need about four to eight ounces of water one to three, those toddlers, my little guys in this age group, we're talking about three cups, then above that, ages four to eight, we're talking five cups, and ages nine and up, we're talking about seven to eight cups a day. Again, depends on weather, what they're doing, and what's going on. So even some adults, never mind kids, have a hard time getting the water that they need. Is there any way, especially for a little one, to make it more appealing? <laughs> yeah, I mean, they have their own agenda, right? They're yeah. busy, they wanna play, they wanna do things. It's hard sometimes to get them to sit down. So I would first say, once you have them sat for mealtime, for snack time, always offer okay. water. You also want to try and make it fun. So if you can <laughs> add some flavors, whether it's some mint, some cucumber, something to make it a little more refreshing. You want to keep fruits and veggies that are high in water around. Okay. I love watermelon, for example. Cucumbers, again, really good veggie to have around. That's can, good. So that counts. It all counts. That's it headed towards counts. that water count, them absolutely, eating watermelon, things like that. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. Whatever they like, whatever you can do, and then let them have a little fun and let them personalize their cups. Let them make oh, some cute. popsicles, whether it's fruit purees and some yogurt. They can really sort of. Water popsicles, also known as ice. <laughs> yeah, right, 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 right. It all counts.
<laughs> I love it. Okay, how can you tell if your child is dehydrated or does need more water? What are signs to look out for? So this is where urine is your best friend. And it sounds oh. weird, but it really is. It <laughs> really is, I promise you. So you want to be looking out for diapers if your child is still in diapers, right? You want to make sure that they're having frequent, constant diapers throughout the day. If your child is already potty trained, you want to make sure that they're going to the bathroom frequently. You can also start to teach them to actually look at their own urine color. And when their urine is getting too dark, that is a sign that they have to up their fluid intake. And you know, Savannah, it's also important to say by the time kids are getting dehydrated you also want to learn to recognize those signs that we're getting into a little bit of trouble the first sign is the mm -hmm. urine but you also want to learn to recognize a child who's getting overly sleepy who's having dry oh, lips flushed skin who's starting to have some lightheadedness some headaches and if those things are happening take them out of the sun out of the heat make sure to increase hydration and call your pediatrician there you go. Oversleepy. I, I would have never known that was related. No, that's exactly right. I mean, if you think about it, our bodies are 60% water. We need water to stay active, to have energy. And when we're dehydrated, that can be a very serious sign. All right, doctor, thank you. Great, great tips. Really important for parents, especially this summer with this heat. Yes, thank you for having great me. Great to see you. Welcome back. Well, new this morning, a free speech battle is brewing with X. That's the company formerly known as Twitter. They are at the center of it. X has filed a legal claim against the Center for Countering Digital Hate, or CCDH. The company announced the news late last night on its blog, claiming that the CCDH has, quote, been actively working to assert false and misleading claims, encouraging advertisers to pause investments on the platform. For more, we are joined by NBC News legal analyst Danny Zavallos, of course, to walk us through this. Hi, Danny, good morning. So let's start here with the big picture. So does Elon Musk and his company X, formerly known as Twitter, do they have a case here? Walk us through what you see. Maybe, ordinarily what I would do is compare this case to other cases like it, but I really don't see a lot of other cases like this. Essentially what X appears to be alleging is that the defendant did what's called scraped data from Twitter. Twitter being public, and I'm still calling it Twitter. Forgive me, I mean X. Mm -hmm. If it, uh, It's accusing the defendants of scraping data, getting data which is already publicly available. That's the essence of X. But they're co allegedly collecting that data, putting it into a spreadsheet, and using it against X in their advocacy, whatever the case may be. And, and X alleges that that is in violation of its terms of service. So I think that already is an uphill battle to complain okay. that you have this, uh, you have this um, app that the essence of it is that it posts things publicly and you're complaining that, hey, people are taking the public information that we're posting on our public platform. I don't know, maybe there's mm. something there. They're also alleging, but these allegations are kind of vague to me, that the defendants use some kind of clandestine login information to get other data. The only reason I think this is a little odd is that if they had evidence that somebody was wrongfully using login uh, credentials, that implicates a lot of federal criminal statutes. So I would uh, be surprised if they had those allegations, if they weren't more specific about them and really yeah. more, I mean, right now, according to the complaint, they don't even really know exactly how it happened. So they're sort of vaguely alleging it. And I think their plan is to prove it through discovery, depositions, document production. Okay, and what about a countersuit here? Could CCDH say, hey, no, you're the one doing something wrong? There are countersuits available for defendants who are sued who allege that the lawsuit is just a means of chilling their First Amendment rights. So you may okay. see that here. Uh, it's hard to say because, again, I go back to the un underlying theory. Yes, they allege breach of contract. But, for example, that breach of contract, and breach of contract is a huge tent. You can allege all kinds of things under breach of contract. Uh, Contract claims already being often amorphous. The claim that they're making is that, look, the user, the defendant is a user of the X product. They entered into the terms of service the way anyone else would, the way you or I would. And they're now doing things that are inconsistent with those terms of service. But I mean, the reality is I could, if I was inclined to do so, go through, spend my entire day going through publicly available information on Twitter and create databases and analyze the data from it. It would be clumsy. I, I'm one human. It would be slow. But I could do it and maybe no one would even know. And it, it's already publicly available. 
So we know that Elon Musk has been very open about freedom of speech being a priority of his. Where does the line draw on that? I mean, does that give uh, X users, not even Elon himself, but users the ability to post anything that they want? Is there a line just quickly? How there, yeah, there's that? a bit of hypocrisy here. You're absolutely right. I mean, if Elon Musk is all about free speech, he's essentially going after a company that's saying uh, mean speech about X or Twitter and saying, hey, you can't do that. So there is a bit of hypocrisy here because Elon Musk, if he is an advocate for free speech, probably shouldn't be bothering an advocacy group that is engaging in free speech that is negative about mm, X. Right. Danny Sabalos, we appreciate you always. Thank you so much. Now let's get to some financial headlines. Tesla is in the hot seat over reports of malfunctioning cars. CNBC's Bertha Coombs joins us with that. Another Money News. Hey, Bertha, good morning. Hey, good morning, Savannah. Federal safety regulators say they're opening a preliminary investigation into Tesla's Model 3 and Model Y from the 2023 model year. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration says that's due to reports of drivers losing the ability to steer the vehicle and the loss of power steering. The agency says it's received a dozen complaints so far from Tesla owners. Meantime, CVS Health will reportedly cut about 5,000 jobs in a move to reduce costs. The Wall Street Journal reports that the layoffs are primarily in corporate roles and that the company does not expect any customer-facing positions in its stores, clinics, or pharmacies to be affected. CVS will offer severance pay, benefits, and help finding another job to those being laid off. The company had about 300,000 employees as of the end of last year. We'll likely hear more tomorrow when they report their quarterly earnings. And AMC is riding the Barbie Heimer box office wave. The theater chain says it earned the most from admissions in its history last week, going back to 2019. The past weekend was AMC's busiest since the pandemic forced theaters to close in March 2020. The company says 65 locations in 19 states and Washington, D.C. set their own box office records. And I, I still maintain, you know, when it's that hot, you want to go see a movie that's three hours long with really nice, good air conditioning. Summer yeah. heat is really good for the box office. That's a good point. Also, it just is a good movie. It doesn't even matter that it's three hours long. They're both fantastic. I've seen okay. them both now. Amazing. <laughs> Highly recommend. Bertha, thank you so much. All right, with gas prices already on the rise, get ready, they could be going up even more. That's because the price of crude oil reached a three-month high on Monday and ended July with its biggest monthly gain since January 2022. That is translating to higher gas prices nationally. AAA says the national average is 3.78 a gallon. That is up 15 cents from, get this, just a week ago and 25 cents from last month. Our friend Caleb Silver, editor-in-chief of Investopedia, joins us now for more on this. Caleb Caleb, good morning. Great to see you. So these crude prices went up because specifically Saudi Arabia is expected to extend cuts in oil production through September. Is that right? And walk us through the reasoning there. Yeah, that's one of the reasons. And this is OPEC and OPEC plus. OPEC plus the allies of OPEC. Guess what? The United States is not one of them. That's Saudi Arabia and Russia. They're extending their production cuts. They're going to bring production down about 5 million barrels a day. They extended cuts into August. Why do they want to do that? They want to stabilize prices and bring prices back up. Right, Higher oil prices means better profits for Saudi Aramco and for oil majors around the world and also for these countries that depend on it. So what does this mean for us here at home when you go fill up, especially if you're like doing a summer road trip, anything like that? Is this a bad time? Yeah, oil prices uh, usually trans are about half the price of a gallon of gas. So the higher oil goes, gas usually falls, usually with a two-week delay. But we also had extreme mm -hmm. heat, and we still have it across parts of this country, especially where the refineries are. So they're not operating at maximum capacity. We're not refining enough gasoline and demand right right now at an all-time high. We're driving, we're flying, diesel fuel, jet fuel prices also up a lot so far in the last couple months. How do you think this ultimately makes the consumer feel, especially when we've kind of had this mixed bag of good news, bad news when it comes to inflation rising and lowering and interest rates and all that kind of stuff? What does higher gas price do to the consumer? Well, we see gas prices all the time. Some people, some small businesses are filling up once, twice a day. So it's one of those things you see, and it's a big inflator and deflator. Gas prices haven't come down so much from last year really brought down overall prices for just about everything. If they're going back up again, you can expect inflation to creep back up again. And we've been talking about inflation coming down. This could reverse course usually till about Labor Day. That's the peak end of driving season. Gas prices should come down after that. But right now, 
they are they're driving higher because of all these factors. So with all these factors, where do you think we're at right now for the American consumer generally, not just talking about gas prices? Are, is this good news? Is this bad news? What do yeah, all these indicators mean? This could potentially be bad news, but consumers are extremely confident right now. We have the most confidence we've had in the past two years, according to the Consumer Confidence Survey. Why? Because prices have come down and there's a lot of jobs out there. So when you have a good jobs market and you have lower inflation, that usually helps things out. So consumers are feeling confident, but a big spike in gas prices, that could uh, wash away that confidence Oof. pretty quickly. All right, Caleb Silver, as always, it's great to see you. Thanks for coming in. Welcome back. Tennis superstar Serena Williams, who's pregnant with her second child, had the gender reveal to top them all. Serena and her husband, Alexis Ohanian, had a big party to celebrate and posted the video on social media. In it, Serena arrives at the baby shower slash gender reveal party in a pink and white skirt and top, making it known she was team pink. However, Ohanian wanted to have a little fun with Williams, and rather than getting a standard pink or blue cake to reveal the baby's gender, he surprised her with a spectacular drone show in the sky with lights, ultimately spelling out girl. Congratulations oh. to the happy mom and dad, as well as big sister Olympia. There you see the moment right there. Lots and lots of joy. That's so cute. That is, I mean, take that 4th of July. Yeah, I know, <laughs> right? And that's good. They stuck to drones. Nothing that's a concern there in this you go. heat. The drones are good. Baby and, reveals, yeah. And Team Pink yeah, gets what they want. So, so cute. I know. There you go. She called it. <laughs> All right. Next up this hour, a pilot who got the opportunity to fulfill his dream this last weekend at the nation's largest summertime hot air balloon festival. Yeah, life-altering accident almost derailed his aspirations, but now he is making history and proving with just a little bit of hard work and determination, the sky is the limit. NBC News reporter Gary Grumbach has this story. It's 6.15 on a Friday morning, and 48-year-old Michael Glenn is attending a weather briefing and getting ready to take flight at the New Jersey Lottery Festival of Ballooning alongside dozens of hot air balloon pilots. People have boats, RVs. We just happen to have a balloon. But Michael's doing it all on two wheels. Michael grew up ballooning, flying with his father and brother. He got his student pilot's license as a teenager and was working towards his private pilot's license when he was involved in a life-altering accident that had him ejected from his vehicle. As you can imagine, you know, your life literally changes overnight. Hospitalized for weeks, Michael's priorities shifted to relearning to walk. But he never lost sight of his goal, to get back in a hot air balloon and earn his pilot's license. You get into a balloon basket just a few months after your mm -hmm. devastating accident. Yeah. Did you think at that point, oh, I'm, I want to get my license? Oh, absolutely, yeah, that, that was almost instant, yes, I want to do this. After being denied a license by the FAA once for being wheelchair bound, Michael doubled down and ended up tripling the number of practice hours required for him to get licensed. Woo, that's hot. If you want to be something new, the answer is always no. You know, they're just going to say no, and you need to go out to him and prove to him. When he obtained his license in 2006, 10 years after his accident, he became the world's first paraplegic hot air balloon pilot. Just because I am in a wheelchair, it doesn't make a difference. What is different is how he flies. It's a duo chariot. It's a, it's a two-seat basket. It works perfect for me. Most balloonists like the bigger baskets because you're able to take multiple people, where this is me plus one. So if you're getting engaged or something, it'd be really romantic for you and I, and you would leave your partner down on the ground. So. Sure. <laughs> Today, Michael Glenn says he's one of five paraplegic hot air balloon pilots in the world and says three of them became pilots after meeting him. The way I live my life is I'm trying still to strive to inspire one person. I know I probably have, but in general, I still just strive for that, just to make a difference in one person's life, to even give them a better day, make it something, show them that they can achieve anything. That's what I shoot for. A history-making pilot encouraging others to soar to new heights. Gary Grumbach, NBC News, <laughs> Reddington, New Jersey. All right, Gary, thank you for that incredible story. Well, now let's get to a story about being at the right place at the right time. A heroic U.S. postal mail carrier is being hailed as a hero after he performed the Heimlich maneuver on a choking customer on his route. And that Amazing. man, Donald Proctor, joins us now. Donald, good morning. Great to have you with us. So I guess describe that moment to us. You're on your route. You see someone who's choking. What exactly was it you did in that moment? Uh, yes, good morning to you. Um, what happened is I'm um, delivering the mail. 
the lady at the exact point in time that I'm going to stick the mail in the slack, she's actually already been choking for about a minute, and she's going over to her home security system to press the button, you know, for an ambulance to come to her home. And then what happened next? Okay, so unbeknownst to me, you know, I just walk away. I'm continuing on to my route. Somehow I hear her. I'm all the way up the block. So I turn around. I run back down to her home. Her face is purple. I ask her if she have an allergic reaction or is she choking. She tries her best to tell me that she's choking. So, you know, I hit her on the back a couple of times. That did nothing. You know, I had to physically turn her around, apply the Heimlich maneuver about two, three times, and a large chunk of food just comes flying out of her mouth. And, um, you know, she gets the color back to her face. She's breathing. And at that point, I just, I couldn't even hold myself up. I just dropped to a knee. Donald, that is just incredible. And then, is this right that you just went right back to work after? And didn't even tell anybody, not um, yes. your bosses or anyone? Uh, no, I didn't tell anybody. Um, but I was so in shock. And I was just so glad that I was there to help her that, you know, I just, I didn't even think to say anything. I just continued on with my route. And, you know, she actually was very adamant, um, you know, about management knowing. And uh, that's how I found out by her informing management. Well, that woman, Jennifer, says that you are her angel, uh, and we would definitely agree with yeah. that. Donald Proctor, great to have you on with us this morning. Thank you for joining us, but most of all, thank you for what you did in yeah. that moment. Yeah, and congratulations. We hear you also received the Postmaster General Hero Award. Okay, yes, uh, I was so honored to receive this. Oh, wow. Ah, uh, Donald, okay, congratulations. <laughs> wow. Thank you so much. That is incredible. Thank you so much. You're here in your community, and we appreciate you joining us this morning. Okay, and I just want to say I want to thank you to Charles Thornton, one of my mentors in the Return to Citizens program, and I love you, Kamal Proctor, my oldest son. He's always with oh. us in spirit. Thank you so much for having me. Oh. That's awesome. That felt like the end of a, an Oscar acceptance speech. Yes, All right, Donald Proctor, it. thank you so much. That's going <laughs> to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Good morning, I'm Savannah Sellers. And I'm Joe Fryer. Right now on Morning News Now, double threat. The grand jury that's investigating efforts to overturn the 2020 election reconvenes today. But that's not the only potential looming legal threat for former President Trump. Georgia is preparing to present its own case for election interference. All as Trump expects to see a federal indictment, quote, any day now. Also this morning, deal derailed with the future of Hunter Biden's plea agreement in limbo. House Republicans are launching an investigation into the deal. The questions they want the attorney general to answer and what it could mean for the future of the case. Plus, survive and advance. Team USA is moving on to the knockout round in the World Cup this morning. But for just the second time in history, they'll advance without winning their group. We're breaking down today's nail-biting action and what comes next for the stars and stripes. And remembering Paul Rubens, this morning friends and fans are paying their respects to the man behind the beloved character, Pee Wee Herman. We'll take a look back at his career on the big and small screens and his touching last words to fans. We've learned that for years he was secretly battling cancer, didn't let anyone know. He's apologizing to fans for not letting them know, but also sharing a few other thoughts. We'll have those coming up yeah, later absolutely. in the hour. Absolutely, that sweet, that last post we saw from him with that. But yeah, you're going to bring us a great remembrance of his legacy. We're going to begin this hour with the new developments this morning and the ongoing investigations into former President Donald Trump. In the classified documents case, Mar-a-Lago employee Carlos de Oliveira was unable to file his plea in court yesterday after failing to obtain a lawyer with a license to practice in the state of Florida. De Oliveira is accused of working with Trump in an attempt to destroy video evidence on the document of the documents, excuse me, in the former president's possession. Meanwhile, the grand jury investigating potential interference in the 2020 election is set to reconvene today. NBC News correspondent Garrett Hake has the latest on all of this from Washington. Today marks two weeks since Donald Trump told the world he's a target of the grand jury investigation going on in the courthouse behind me, an investigation he now says he believes will soon end with his indictment. This morning, former President Trump's co-defendant in the classified documents case, Mar-a-Lago employee Carlos de Oliveira, is out on bond, entering no plea during his first court appearance in Miami Monday. Prosecutors say Mr. Trump asked de Oliveira to delete security camera footage at the estate in order to obstruct the investigation. 
Now, another indictment of the former president is looming, tied to his efforts to overturn the 2020 election, with Mr. Trump warning on social media that an indictment could come, quote, any day now, attacking election interference and prosecutorial misconduct. These are ridiculous indictments. In Washington, the grand jury hearing evidence in the case is scheduled to meet today. Meanwhile, in Georgia, Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis, investigating Mr. Trump for election interference there, is set to present her case to a grand jury. The work is accomplished. I mean, we've been working for two and a half years. We're ready to go. It comes as a Georgia judge has rejected a Trump bid to shut down the DA's investigation while blasting the former president's lawyers for, quote, unnecessary and unfounded legal filings ahead of a potential indictment. Despite the legal troubles swirling around Mr. Trump, a new poll shows the former president still dominating the 2024 GOP field, ahead of his closest rival, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, by 37 points, with the rest of the field far behind. According to the poll, even those who don't support Mr. Trump want to defend him, with 71 percent of Republican primary voters saying the party must stand behind him in the face of his criminal charges. Still, DeSantis on Fox News suggesting the former president has amassed too much baggage to beat President Biden next year. I think that there's too many voters who just aren't going to vote for him going forward. Voters may not agree with the governor's assessment. That same poll mentioned in the piece shows President Biden and Mr. Trump tied at 43 percent apiece nationally in a hypothetical 2020 reelection rematch. All right, Garrett, thank you so much. In Washington this morning, Republicans on Capitol Hill are turning up the heat on President Biden and his son Hunter. This comes just a day after a former business partner, partner of Hunter, Hunter's testified in a highly anticipated closed door hearing in Washington. NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander joins us now with the latest on this. Peter, good morning. So Devin Archer is that former business partner. He yeah. met with lawmakers to discuss Hunter Biden's business dealings. This was a private meeting, but what have we learned about his testimony? Yeah, you're right, Joe. So this business partner's name, as you noted, former business partner, is Devin Archer. He answered questions for about four hours, told this Republican-led House committee that Hunter Biden sold the illusion of access to his father. Lawmakers say that Archer insisted that Joe Biden was never directly involved in his son's financial dealings, but that Hunter put his father on speakerphone with clients and former business associates maybe 20 times over 10 years, including when Biden was vice president, to try to impress them here. The committee's top Republican says that Hunter was selling the Biden, quote, brand, but a leading Democrat pushed back on that, saying that it was all niceties, like about the weather and what's going on, that Archer said there was not a single conversation about Hunter's business dealings. Republicans here, they've made the argument, Joe, that Joe Biden lied, that he had no involvement in his son's work, saying it's grounds for impeachment. But overnight, the White House said that Republicans keep promising bombshell evidence, but that they keep failing to produce any. The White House called the attacks ridiculous. Joe. So, Peter, in a separate matter, a few House Republican committee members announced they're investigating the circumstances surrounding Hunter Biden's plea deal with the Department of Justice. They wrote a letter to Attorney General Merrick Garland. What exactly are they demanding here? Yeah, so in that letter to the Attorney General, the three Republican chairmen, including Jim Jordan, they highlighted a provision in that pretrial diversion agreement that would have put the onus on the judge overseeing this case to determine over a 24-month period if the president's son had violated the terms of the plea deal. The judge there, appointed by former President Trump, last week said that doing that would be basically outside of her authority, outside the scope of what she can do. The congressional Republicans also took issue with the clause in the agreement that would have given Biden immunity from all other crimes in exchange for completing that pretrial diversion program. They said that those provisions raised serious concerns. Hunter Biden pleaded not guilty to federal tax charges, as you know, last week after the judge raised questions about the terms of this whole agreement. He was expected going into that to plead guilty to a pair of charges for failing to pay taxes under a deal that he had struck with the government. But instead, Hunter Biden pleaded not guilty to those charges until both sides here can meet and address all the judge's questions. Joe and Savannah. All right, Peter, thank you so much. Well, new this morning in the war between Ukraine and Russia, a skyscraper in Moscow has been hit by a second drone attack in as many days. Russia has blamed Ukraine for this latest attack. NBC News Chief Foreign Correspondent Richard Engel is watching the latest developments, of course, and he joins us now. Hi, Richard. Good morning. 
Uh, good morning, Savannah. Yes, it happened again. In fact, some people in Moscow were looking at this building that was hit by a drone on Sunday, inspecting the previous damage, when suddenly they heard a new blast and started running. President Putin's war in Ukraine is now coming home to Russia, right to the capital. Another drone this morning slipped through Moscow's defenses, smashing and exploding into a high-rise, housing three government ministries in the business district. There were no reports of casualties from the early-hour blast, which targeted the very same building attacked by drones on Sunday. Russia blames Ukraine for the attacks, which are intensifying rapidly in and around Moscow. The drones are doing very little damage. They're small and light. These seem more akin to psychological operations to expose ordinary Russians to the conflict and embarrass President Putin. Over the weekend, Ukraine's President Zelensky didn't claim responsibility for the drone attacks, but didn't exactly deny them either, saying the war is now shifting to Russia, calling the move just. This morning, Russia retaliated with its own drone strikes, targeting a student dormitory in the Ukrainian city of Kharkiv. There were no students in at the time. That was not the case yesterday, when Russia fired two missiles at an apartment building full of civilians in President Zelensky's hometown, killing officials say at least six people, including a young girl and her mother. Ukraine has promised not to use Western-supplied weapons out for attacks outside of its borders. Ukraine has been developing its own fleet of armed drones, experimenting to extend their range and make them harder to stop. It is a homegrown industry, and it is one of Ukraine's top priorities right now. Savannah? All right, Richard, thank you so much. We have been following Buffalo Bill's safety, Damar Hamlin's recovery after a medical emergency on the field last season nearly ended his life. Now, almost seven months later, he is back on the field practicing with his teammates. NBC News correspondent Sam Brock joins us with the latest. Sam, good morning. Joe, good morning. Almost seven months to the day. How about that? And what a remarkable turnaround. As you said, DeMar Hamlin can now take hits. The inspirational defensive player, Joe, now going on offense, leading a CPR tour across the country, part of his new mission to save lives. With thousands cheering him on, it was a monumental Monday for Buffalo Bills safety DeMar Hamlin. The 25-year-old practicing in pads for the first time since suffering cardiac arrest following a routine hit during a January game last season. The nation watching as Hamlin received CPR on the field, nearly losing his life. It feels amazing. It's a roller coaster of emotions. I was kind of all over the place, you know, just kind of being back for the first time. Now, months after being cleared to return to football and a day after scooping up a young fan, number three's presence in full pads, a welcomed sight. Hamlin admitted, while it's not easy, easing back under a bright spotlight, he welcomes the challenge. I think there's strength in, you know, going through a process in front of, the, in front of everybody's eyes. You know, it, it shows vulnerability, it shows strength, it shows perseverance. Hamlin's recovery, an uplifting outlook, helping further his mission to serve others. That includes leading a recent CPR tour with his Chasing M's Foundation. They are the reason why I'm standing here in front of you today. And honoring the Bills medical staff during an emotional tribute at last month's ESPY Awards. Damar, first and foremost, thank you for staying alive, brother. <laughs> exactly one week before Hamlin retook the field, USC incoming freshman Bronny James, the son of NBA superstar LeBron James, collapsed during practice also suffering cardiac arrest. Within minutes of the news emerging, Hamlin sending prayers to Bronny and thanking the entire James family. They've been um, really big and supportive and reaching out to my family as well. I wanted to let him know I'll be there, you know, for whatever he needs on his journey as far as his recovery. Now, with Bronny discharged from the hospital and on the mend, Hamlin clearing a major hurdle of his own Monday and looking up to the sky in thanks. To be able to come out here and compete again, because that's such a blessing. Life is bigger than football, but this is what I love to do. As for the question so many are wondering right now, Joe and Savannah, when is he going to get back into game action? The Bills' first preseason game is in less than two weeks, August 12th. Then their first official game is against the Jets on September 11th. The Bills so far have given every indication they're going to go at DeMar Hamlin's pace. Hamlin says that his faith is stronger than his fear.
Guys, back to you. And mm. that's understandable after everything that's gone <laughs> happened Absolutely. in the last seven months. Yeah. All right, Sam, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Amazing to see. Well, summer storms are brewing in the middle of the country. Let's get a check on your morning news now. Weather? Meteorologist Angie Lastman joins us now. Angie, so how much rain can we expect in some spots? There's a couple of spots where we could see upwards of a couple of inches and, and uh, flooding conditions potentially across the, those areas here over the next couple of days. Let's talk about where we stand currently with our satellite and our radar. We've got a line of thunderstorms developing across mainly the state of Missouri right now. We've also got some showers that have been focused out towards the Rockies so far this morning, but we're going to continue to see that potential for some heavy rain and even some strong storms through the day today. Let's start with the rain. There's that flood watch that I mentioned. It does stretch into places like Cheyenne, including Denver. There'll be multiple rounds of rain on kind of the back end of the system, uh, while the front end of the system shows us some of those showers and thunderstorms that I just mentioned in parts of Missouri and stretching a little farther east in the coming days. There's the showers that we expect throughout the uh, Denver area here as we get into the later afternoon hours. We'll also see some stronger storms into parts of the northern plains and stretching into the Midwest. And then that rain kind of focuses a little farther to the east and we'll continue to see a moderate risk of flooding as we get into tomorrow for places like St. Louis. But there's the severe storm risk. This is the area we're mainly watching. It does include places like Fargo and Bismarck, and it's mainly going to be the strong winds and the large hail. The good news is that tornado threat is low, but we are going to see upwards of, as I mentioned, two, even three, as high as four inches in localized areas across the same kind of section. So stretching from Kentucky basically into Iowa with the biggest amounts expected in places like Columbia, Missouri, really through central Missouri is where we're looking at those heaviest, uh, the heaviest rain working through. So umbrella is going to be needed in the coming days, and you're definitely going to want to watch for it. The flooded roadways, we remember not to drive through those. Meanwhile, the heat, that's what we've really been talking about for weeks and weeks, right? We finally roll into August, continuing with summer, but at least our heat alerts aren't for hundreds of millions of people. Now it's just kind of centered around parts of the south in a couple of spots in the southwest. We've got 43 million people under these heat alerts with some more record highs potentially as we get into the later parts of today. Houston heads to 104. That could break a record of 103. Same goes for Dallas, which could potentially tie a record later this afternoon. And we'll deal with more of the same tomorrow with triple digit temperatures from Houston to Del Rio and into Roswell. These temperatures are going to stick with us really in that area through the extended period. Meanwhile, a break in parts of the northeast. You probably noticed uh, over the weekend, that big drop in temperatures here as we went from Sunday into Monday, it felt a lot nicer and it's going to stay right where it should for these areas. We'll see a little bit of a warm up in places like Chicago and Detroit as we get into the end of the week. Cincinnati will hit 90 on Friday, but for the most part, guys, these temperatures are really where they should be. Uh, not quite as warm as they were last week, but still very summer like we're still in, you know, in the swing of summer. So uh, it's better to talk about average temperatures yeah. than 10 degrees, 15 degrees above average, right? It's so strange to see the yellow and oranges all over the map. Yeah. <laughs> it's you red. red. Fiery red. Also, exactly. I don't know why your graphic is cracking me up. North stays comfy. It's so comfy. You like that? It's comfy. It's comfy. comfy. I'm going to use that all the time now. <laughs> comfy 87 degrees. Exactly. It does point. feel better, though. All right. We are back with the World Cup, and Team USA's women have scraped through to the knockout round of the tournament following a nail-biting 0-0 tie against Portugal. It was a make-or-break game where a loss would have sent the U.S. home in group play for the first time ever. But the result means Team USA qualifies in second place behind the Netherlands, who beat Vietnam 7-0 in the group's other match. In just a few moments, we are so excited that we're going to get to talk to two-time World Cup winner Ashlyn Harris. She's here on set with us. But before that, let's get out to NBC's Molly Hunter in Auckland, New Zealand, Molly, who has been having the time of her life, by the way. Molly, <laughs> great to see you, as always. All right, close one for Team USA, but they managed to get through in the end. Tell us about it. Samantha, I don't think you believe that I'm actually not just parting your 24-7. <laughs> Every live shot I do just happens to align with that because it's so late at night. Look, don't let the party atmosphere kind of fool you. It is not the result that the U.S. team or the U.S. fans here really wanted. That 0-0 was gut-wrenching to watch. Look, they even put Megan Rapino in at the 61st minute to really inject some energy into that game, and she instantly sparked some real moves on the field. The 90th minute, and there was eight minutes of additional play, the 90th minute, with absolutely uh, the most anxiety-producing minute of soccer I've ever watched. You have Alex Morgan, who's the U.S. co-captain, take a knee.
near miss shot on the Portuguese goal. You had a Portuguese shot that hit the goal post for the U.S. They were making subs in the final two minutes, but they just didn't have what it takes. And look, Portugal, one of the debutantes of this World Cup, played a very, very strong game, guys. Whatever dance party is going on over your left shoulder, I, I either want to be a part of or I'm scared to be a part yeah, of. I'm not know. sure which. That's but staying away. Let's talk about what's next for Team USA. Do we know who they could play in the next round? <laughs> We do. So all of this is basically being figured out in the next 24 hours. So we will have a much fuller picture of the bracket. But for the U.S., because they came second under the Netherlands in their group, they are heading to Melbourne. We are also heading to Melbourne next week, where they will play Sweden. Sweden is a very, very tough team. Uh, but they do have five days. And when I spoke with Megan Rapino after the game, you guys, she said they really need these five days as a team to really, look, analyze, focus in, and figure out how to bring a better game to Sweden. She also said, though, she lives for these moments. These are these big uh, pressure moments that the World Cup is all about for her, guys. Molly, other games are happening right now. What are you keeping? <laughs> as well as the dance party. <laughs> I can't even. It's just so funny. Every time we come to you, you weren't here yesterday. She was a whole other thing. There's just always so much going on. Molly, what else are you keeping an eye on? So then I've decided not to have television screens directly in my <laughs> line of sight when I'm talking to you specifically <laughs> after yesterday. However, over my shoulder, you will see there is actually another uh, game going on. Uh, the Lionesses, the English team, and China facing off. Right now, it looks like it's 3-0 England. England looks like they are definitely through in their group, but that is going to be a very tough team as well uh, that the U.S. may see down the road, guys. We didn't notice anything happening over your right shoulder because not what was all. happening over your left shoulder was far, far yeah. more distracting. Molly keep living it up and doing your fantastic reporting and interviews. Thank you so much. Let's bring in Ashlyn Harris. She is a two-time World Cup champion with Team USA and Gotham FC Global Creative Advisor. Good to have you with us. So everyone is sort of assessing this, taking it all in. How do you describe Team USA's performance here? I think we're underperforming. I think that's safe to say everyone's talking about it at this point. Um, I don't think any of, if you asked any player, they would be happy with their individual performance at this point in the tournament. But we have, we can't be so critical. We are moving on. There are a lot of teams who are not. And even though it's not the best performance, mm -hmm. it's not the USA mentality that everyone is talking about, we also need to realize that this is a new team that they're getting settled into the tournament. A lot of these players have never played on this type of stage. And as we continue to progress, they have to deliver. They have to be better individually and they have to be better collectively. And we can't press the panic button now. It is a moment to say, okay, we have to reflect on the things we've done well. We're moving on, that's a good thing. Let's stay positive with that. But also like the game plan isn't working. So how are we gonna change hmm. it? Absolutely. Yeah, good to keep in mind. We won one game, mm -hmm. two ties, mm -hmm. haven't lost. Uh, Molly just referenced there talking with Megan Rapino, who said, you know, it's great we have the five days. Mm -hmm. As someone who's been on that team and as somebody who I know is speaking to this team, what are these next five days like? What does the team do? Five days is a long time. To sit on the performances of the last three matches could be difficult because this is a mental battle that people don't realize. Everyone at the highest level is physically incredible at what they do. This is a tournament that anyone can grab. So for me, five days, we have to really build on how we want to be better as a team and what we're going to do to execute a game plan based on playing Sweden, hmm. because Sweden's a really hard matchup. How much of this is ability and talent versus mental? Does this team have the skill to win it all, and it's just a matter of getting over some of the mental blocks, or is the experience thing a bit of an issue here, too? I mean, it's always going to be an issue, right? The average age of this team is so young. A lot of these young kids have never been in a tournament like this. They don't understand the expectation. They don't understand the weight of every single thing that they do. But also, we, ha we have to understand that the U.S. is the best team in the world for a reason, mm. and excuses are not going to get you to the next round. So we have to pull, you know, our big girl shorts up <laughs> and, and own the moment. And we have to perform. We have to play better. If we want to continue in this tournament, we have to forget the last three games because they're not going to help us. Hmm. We need to be a totally different team. And we need to execute. And, and we need to score goals. And we need to be lethal. We need to be on our front foot. We need to bring back that U.S. mentality that every country feared 
stepping on the field. And you think we can? I absolutely think we can. I think we will. That's great to hear. What about the other teams? Have you been impressed or surprised by them sort of raising their game? I said this from the beginning. It is anyone's tournament. Mm. Germany's lost. Brazil's lost. Canada is out. I mean, this the parity in this tournament, it's the best it's ever been. Wow. So I, I, I think at this point, whoever is building, whoever is vibing, whoever is lethal in front of goal, they're going to continue moving forward in this tournament. Um, but like I said before, anyone can win. It's anyone's to grab at this point. Molly mentioned that Megan said she lives for this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she lives for the big moments. She's not stressed at all. I think the hardest oh. part for Megan Rapino is she's playing a different role this tournament. She's not getting the minutes she's used to getting. Uh, she's used to carrying this team on, on her back. So my hope is if we play Sweden, that's most likely what's going to happen. She's got to start. We need something mm. different. Uh, right now, it's it's too uh, static. It's too un like we need to be unpredictable. Right now, we're too predictable, mm. which makes it easy. And Megan Rapino is a type of player that you have no idea what she's going to give the game. But that's a good thing. All right, love it, Ashlyn. Thank you so much for joining this us. We so really cool appreciate having your you. perspective. Thanks, Thanks thank for having me. Thank you for me. coming over here. So good to see you. Well, let's stay international now. China is bracing for a third typhoon after weeks of heavy rain and deadly flooding. NBC News foreign correspondent Ali Aruzi is back with that and other world news. Ali, good morning. Good morning, Joe. Good morning, Savannah. That's right. At least uh, 11 people have died and around a dozen others are missing after torrential rains pounded Beijing. But the deluge isn't over as China braces for a third typhoon in as many weeks. Heavy rains are likely to persist uh, over the weekend and flooding could worsen in northern regions of Beijing, according to the Emergency Management Ministry. Relentless rain over the weekend broke daily precipitation records at 14 weather stations in Beijing. Over to Myanmar, where the junta partly pardoned jailed former leader Aung San Suu Kyi on five of the 19 offenses for which she was convicted, but she will remain under house arrest. The pardon means that six years will be shaved off her 33-year jail term. Uh, in part of an amnesty under which more than 7,000 prisoners were freed across the troubled country. And finally, a mystery has been solved. A giant metal dome that was found washed up on the beach in Australia that had everybody puzzled turns out to be part of a polar satellite launch vehicle, according to India's space agency spokesperson. The spokesperson said it would be up to Australia to, do, to decide what to do with the object. India doesn't seem particularly keen on getting it back. Yeah. <laughs> Not a UAP, though. There we go. So. Yeah. Oh, God, don't even get us started on that path right now. Ali Ruzi, thank you so much. Welcome back. Major changes are coming to Wisconsin's Supreme Court. Later today, a new justice will be sworn. And with that, it will mark the first time in 15 years that liberal justices will have the majority on the court. And that could have a major impact on the state's most consequential issues. NBC News correspondent Shaq Brewster joins us now from Madison, Wisconsin. Hi, Shaq. Always great to see you. Put this in perspective for us. How big of a political shift is this? Well, we're talking about a really big shift here in the state of Wisconsin, Savannah. You know, back in April, when this open seat uh, was up for grabs, uh, this election was described as the most consequential election of the year. While the liberal judge won that race, giving liberals and progressives a chance that they haven't had uh, to control the court in some 15 years, that means the power to influence policy in this state that they haven't had in even longer than that. I want you to listen to what a professor here at the University of Wisconsin uh, told me just yesterday about what this really means for this state. But this court has really risen to the top of the policymaking system in Wisconsin. And it's not just this election and these issues. Really, the court has become a bigger player in state politics in recent years, in part because of the stalemate between the Democratic governor and Republican legislature feuds over all kinds of things are being decided there. That's become the venue. 
And believe it or not, we're already seeing action from this court. We're learning through local reporting this morning that the liberal justices will likely fire the state court's director. Uh, that's one of the powers that they have. They can now control how business is done at the state Supreme Court. They can decide and set new ethical rules. That's something that has also been signaled in the past. So we're expecting to see a lot of changes here in Wisconsin, not just in how the court operates, but those ultimate decisions that are made. Absolutely. Shaq, when we look ahead at the court's term, of course, abortion rights, one of the issues people are watching closely. Walk us through those, some of the other consequential particular issues that may come before this court. Really big issues here. We'll start with abortion rights. This is a state where abortion is nearly completely banned. We're already seeing cases move their way through the court. So this will end up before the state Supreme Court, and they will rule on whether uh, abortion remains banned in this state. But you see the other issues there. Redistricting. The previous court sided with maps, uh, uh, legislative maps that benefited Republicans in this state. The court will be able to revisit those. You also see election procedure and challenges. Liberal groups already filed the legal challenge just in the past couple of weeks against some of the election rules in this state dealing with uh, the ban on drop boxes, dealing with early voting. This court will have influence over all of that. One thing to note here, uh, Professor Barry, he, he mentioned that this won't be an immediate change. You won't expect to see change in the next couple of days or weeks in terms of those issues. But listen to what he laid out when I asked him about a potential timeline for the shift here. It's going to be some months before we get decisions. It might be after the new year into the spring, potentially of 2024. But I would say within a year, within this year term from 2023 to 2024, the public ought to expect some really important new decisions coming out of the court. I think one way you can think of this is if you look at what happened at the federal level with the United States Supreme Court, we saw the appointment of, Gus of Justice Gorsuch, of uh, Justice Kavanaugh, of Justice Barrett, and then you saw some significant change. So that change did come, but it took some time to actually take place. Yeah, it's a great point. Shaq, what about the implications beyond the borders of Wisconsin? Should people living across the country care here? Yes, and, you know, I'm competing with the ambulance here, but, you know, the change that you can see, two big issues and two big points I'll make. One, the shift to a more liberal court, that runs a little bit counter to what you've seen in some other states where you've seen yeah. state courts become more conservative. So that is a big shift there. And what that means is that some of those election-related decisions, we know Wisconsin is this uh, automatic battleground state. It's a purple state. The past few elections have all come uh, and been decided by less than 1%. I believe it was four out of the last five presidential elections in this state. So when you're talking about whether drop boxes will be allowed or whether absentee ballots will be allowed, that matters. That can help determine the United States president there. And you're also talking about election challenges. We remember that back in 2020, former President Trump filed challenges to Wisconsin's election, challenges that if he was successful in the courts, mm. could have overturned the election or at least flipped the result in that ultimate, uh, in the election uh, in 2020. Uh, now with a more liberal Supreme Court, you heard this during the election, uh, they say they will protect democracy, that they would uh, view those challenges a little bit more skeptically. So when you look at presidential politics, mm. Wisconsin is at the center of it, and this court will influence what ultimately happens. Shaquille Brewster, fantastic reporting as always. Thanks for joining us. We're back now with some money news. A major tech giant is making some strides in health care. That's right. CNBC's Bertha Coombs is back with that and other financial headlines. Hey, Bertha. Hey, Joe and Savannah. You know, Amazon has been looking to get into healthcare for five years now. Now they're expanding their virtual clinic, Amazon Clinic, nationwide. That service will be out there in all 50 states. They launched Amazon Clinic late last year in November with the aim uh, for patients to connect with telemedicine providers. It provides treatments for common conditions like hair loss, migraines, acne, and also sexual health. Amazon Clinic does not accept insurance yet, though. Still, consumers can use insurance to pay for any medications that are prescribed through the service. Nearly half of consumers will turn to some form of financing for their back-to-school shopping this year. A new survey from CNET Money finds 43% will use credit or buy-now-pay-later programs as they face persistent inflation and price hikes on many goods. Nearly 90%, though, say that they'll use at least one money-saving hack, like a coupon or 
watching for sales and discounts, which I don't know, some of us watch for all the time. They'll also shop by comparison for pricing and likely buy fewer things and switch to cheaper brands. The average household's forecast to spend about $890 on back to school shopping. That's up 3% from last year. And X no longer marks the spot. That brightly flashing X sign on the top of the San Francisco headquarters of the company formerly known as Twitter has been removed. The sign was installed on the roof of the building last, late last week. The city's Department of Building Inspection says it received two dozen complaints about the structure, including about its safety and the bright lights, which would flash. Representatives for X have yet to respond to messages for comment, I suppose, either on X itself or in the traditional way when we call them over the phone and ask via yeah. email. <laughs> right. But, uh, I still haven't gotten used to As a branding experiment, I guess, I guess we're all talking about it, so maybe that worked. I don't know. Yeah. The Except, people that lived in the apartment building across the street were certainly talking about it. They were not happy about exactly. the flashing lights. Fair. Are we supposed to say you X'd something no. instead of you tweeted something? I still haven't figured this out. But anyway. That's a great question. All right, Bertha, thank you so much. <laughs> Movies like Ocean's Eleven make pulling off complicated heists look so easy. Well, now a new Hulu documentary called The Jewel Thief is exploring firsthand the highs and the lows of a real-life professional thief. It takes viewers inside the mind of Gerald Blanchard, once known as the world's most ingenious thief and it's going to show us his life of crime he went from a small town thief to a money-making machine if you could rob the banks why not i studied everything as the bank is being built he's putting ways to get in and ways to get out of the bank i've never even heard of anything like this we had banks calling us in the dozens and i was pretty good at it this is so cool. Joining us now is Landon Van Seuss, director of The Jewel Thief, as well as detectives Mitchell McCormick and Larry Lavasser, who tracked Blanchard around from country to country. Good morning to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us. Landon's here on set with us, and the two of them are together. Landon, first, just tell us what attracted you to this story as a director. Oh, there's really so much. I mean, it's just such a head-spinning story. Yeah. It's just truly stranger than fiction, you know? <laughs> I mean, you hear these stories about parachuting into a castle in Vienna, you know, and it sounds like it's straight out of some Hollywood right. heist movie, but... I think for me to realize that that was the culmination of this decades-long crime spree that included bank robberies and frauds and international heists all over the world. I mean, there's just so much to sink your teeth into. Oh. My goodness. Let's chat with the detectives here, starting with Detective McCormick. I mean, how much of a full-circle moment was this documentary for you after tracking Blanchard yeah. down for so long? You know, it was a, it was a great culmination of uh, what we found to be a uh, quite an interesting uh, investigation, and uh, you'll see it when you see the documentary. You know, when, when you're a policeman, you, you, you find the criminals kind of get into a niche. They either do robberies, and that's all they do, or break and enters, and that's all they do, or frauds. Now, uh, Mr. Blanchard uh, went the gamut on crime, and he did it very well, and he did it very successfully for a very, very long time. And Detective Lavasser, I mean, save some of this for the documentary. No major spoilers, but just tell us a little bit about what it was like ultimately closing in and then the relationship with Blanchard now after this long history. Uh, well, it uh, actually came to a conclusion uh, very quickly in, uh, in, in that particular year. And uh, we, had, we had received some information that we had to act upon uh, immediately as Mitch uh, mentioned uh, there was a whole array of crimes that he was involved in and uh, uh, we had to react quickly uh, back then with respect to some assault rifles that he was negotiating a deal on so we couldn't have those hitting mm. the streets of uh, of the city um, but yeah it uh, it uh, came together uh, nicely uh, it took uh, a little bit of time to uh, get all the exhibits together and resolve but uh, at the end of the day, uh, uh, we were uh, successful. You know, Landon, the poster for the movie shows, I think, another little star of this, which is a specific jewel. Yeah. Um, talk about that jewel and what we should know about it and what role it plays in helping this all come together. 
Yeah, so this was a, it's actually a hair ornament um, that was worn by Empress Sisi, um, who's sort of been um, related to Princess Di, maybe, of Austria, but she's a historic figure that's, that's quite popular there. Um, and most of them have been lost to time. Um, so it's one of very few in the world. I mean, I think it truly does equate to some kind of a crown jewel for the people of Austria. Um, and it was being housed in a historic museum there um, when Blanchard kind of first let, set his eyes on it. <laughs> That's oh, he did. He said more than his eyes yeah, on it. Exactly. <laughs> um, Detective McCormick, if you look back to when you were tracking Blanchard, I mean, we've heard a little bit of some of these just like fantastic details here, but was there a particular turning point when you realized that this was not a typical case, not an ordinary criminal, and this was going to be as extensive as it was? Well, you know, again, we, Larry and I have done some wiretap in our career, and most wiretaps you're going to find that uh, uh, criminals are very guarded. They talk in a code. Uh, uh, it was quite the contrary when we ended up hooking up and listening to Mr. Blanchard. And uh, the time that really turned the page for us was, although we didn't get information that he was a suspect uh, in the, the theft of the Sissy Star, which, you know, we didn't have too much in the way of Interpol, but... When we wired up and he was putting his group together to go do a major fraud in Cairo and he was doing it and he got people in the air and in Cairo within a day or two uh, when he was talking to a guy that he called the boss from London, England. That's when it really took off and became really international for us and uh, and really said that this is a, a lot bigger than just break-ins and, and thefts and frauds and uh, offenses in Canada. This became an international thing for us and that yeah. took on a a totally different scope and it, and it really became uh, mm -hmm. uh, something that was interesting and different from what we had done in our careers at that time. So Detective Lavasser, are there lessons you learned in this case that could apply mm -hmm. in the future for other tough cases with criminal masterminds like this one? Uh, absolutely. I think uh, bottom line is uh, communication uh, between uh, law enforcement agencies uh, you know, not on just a, a local level, but on a national level and obviously internationally. Um, you know, uh, you hear about, uh, you know, Interpol and, uh, you know, it's always uh, in a James Bond movie or something like that. But it actually exists and uh, it's really an important uh, tool uh, for law enforcement right around the world mm. to be able to, you know, effectively enforce the laws of their respective countries. So. Uh, it's important that we maintain that and uh, continue that going forward as, as, a, as a world population. Oh, well, it is just so cool to get to talk to all of you involved here. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate your time this morning. And again, the documentary is called The Jewel Thief. It is streaming on Hulu right now. Thank you guys. So exciting. Congratulations on it. Welcome back. This is um, a, an interesting one. Scientists may have just made a big breakthrough in future treatment for depression and anxiety. By tickling rats, the researchers first implanted electrodes into the rats, and then they tickled the rats and analyzed their brain activity. That is when they noticed one particular area of the brain lit up, causing the rats to get this, to laugh. Who knew that? Who knew that rats could laugh? Well, by comparison, when rats were put in environments that made them anxious, that same part of their brain did not light up even if they were tickled. The team plans to investigate this in future studies to help humans and other animals combat depression and anxiety. And who knew I could say tickled so many times in one story. Exactly. Who, and who came up with that idea? I My know. Goodness. And All we right. needed the footage of the tickling. <laughs> exactly. like, so. We want rat tickling footage. <laughs> All right. We're going to end this hour with a literary legend, Judy Bloom. Her beloved classic novel, Summer Sisters, is being re-released in honor of its 25th anniversary. And today's show co-host Jenna Bush Hager sat down with Bloom at her Key West bookstore to discuss her life and legacy. Lining the walls of books and books in Key West, Florida are the names of local literary legends. Ernest Hemingway, Tennessee Williams, Shel Silverstein. But another literary legend is working behind the counters, Judy Bloom. And that's going to be for you too. Perfect. This is a great love of your life, this town, and it happened kind of accidentally. We came here for a month because I was trying to finish Summer Sisters. It was just put yourself someplace else and forget all your troubles. 
the prolific author has written 29 books with 90 million copies sold, including bestsellers like Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing and Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret, which recently became a Hollywood movie more than 40 years after she wrote the book. Please, 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 please. Growing up in Elizabeth, New Jersey, Judy's love of literature started early. Your mom was the one that showed you the love of reading. My mother loved to read. She loved books. My mother was a worrier, anxious mm -hmm. about everything, but never about what we were reading. You would make up stories in your head that kind of answered the secrets you thought adults were keeping from you. What were those secrets? Family secrets yeah. was the kind of thing where when you were a kid and you walked into the room, all the adults stopped talking. At 25, Judy found herself married with children. Judy says she felt like she was playing at being a married lady. She started writing picture books for her two young children, a labor of love and a creative escape for the New Jersey housewife. And so do you feel like writing was in some ways, it was an incredible outlet. So cathartic. Yeah. It gave me a life. It gave me my own life. Judy's books explore topics like racism, grief, religion, and menstruation. Topics that made kids feel less alone. You would hear from kids that they felt seen. They felt enough. Um, they were told the truth, too. What was that like hearing from these readers? Well, it was so unbelievable because I never dreamed of anything like that. And then they started to come. and Like 2,000 a month. <laughs> they, it, there were a lot of them, yes. And, I mean, some of them were so desperate. It was tough. Yeah. It was very tough. For a couple of years there, in the 80s, mm -hmm. I couldn't write at all because I was just answering their letters. Wow. And so I had to learn to remove myself enough so that I could write again. That same giant heart knew when someone special walked into her life 43 years ago. She says with George, her third husband, she found her true love. My magic. Mm -hmm. What about him is so magical to you? Sometimes you just meet a person and you've had such an adventure of, of a life. I think we have. <laughs> I've never been bored mm. when George is around. Judy published her final book, The Unlikely Event, in 2015. Now she spends her days in her Key West bookstore helping customers. More than 50 years later, Judy's books are still changing lives and making readers feel less alone. I read somewhere that you even plan to take Are You There, God, with you into the next life. I want a little bench or a little stone or something that says, Are You There, God? It's me, Judy. Oh. <laughs> That's very cool. And our thanks to Jenna for that report. That does it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Stay with us. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.